Section 49 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic, a Practical Treatise on the Art of Conjuring by Professor Lewis Hoffman. Stage Tricks, Part 4. The Vanishing Pocket Handkerchief Found in a Candle. This was a favorite trick of Robert Howden, by whom we believe it was invented. The performer borrows a lady's handkerchief, drawing particular attention to the fact that he takes the first handkerchief which may be offered, and that it is wholly free from preparation. Fixing upon some gentleman among the audience, he asks him if he thinks he could set fire to the handkerchief. The person addressed naturally expresses his belief that he could. The performer ventures to doubt it, and at once fetches a lighted candle to enable him to try the experiment, meanwhile spreading the borrowed handkerchief over the top of a small round table or guéridon, where it remains in full view of the spectators, showing clearly that it is not tampered with in any way. Returning with the candle, the performer hands it to the gentleman and requests him to go and set fire to the handkerchief. Hardly, however, has he taken the first step to do so when the handkerchief suddenly vanishes, its disappearance being so rapid that the spectators cannot even decide in which direction it traveled. The performer accuses the gentleman, who is still holding the candlestick, of having the handkerchief about him. This he naturally denies. The professor insists, and after keeping up the dispute as long as the audience are amused by it, offers to prove his assertion, and taking the candle from the candlestick, breaks it in half, and produces from it the borrowed handkerchief, which is immediately identified by the owner. This capital trick requires the aid of a special table. The top is thin and without fringe or ornament of any kind, allowing no apparent space for the concealment of even the smallest article. The center pillar, however, is a hollow tube, and it is into this that the handkerchief is made to vanish. The first step in the trick is to exchange the handkerchief for a substitute, See page 240. This substitute is spread over the top of the table. The real handkerchief the performer carries with him when he leaves the stage under the pretense of fetching the candle, and utilizes his momentary absence in placing it inside the candle, which is hollow, and of the description mentioned at page 251. When the gentleman advances to set fire to the handkerchief, the pulling of a string by the assistant causes a clip to rise up in the center of the table and nip the middle of the handkerchief, which is instantly drawn down within the tube through a small trap at its upper extremity. The Sphinx Few tricks have of late years caused so great a sensation as this now well-known illusion, which was first introduced to the London public by the late Colonel Stodare in 1865. We cannot better preface the explanation of the trick than by quoting a portion of the Times notice on the subject of October 19, 1865. Most intricate is the problem proposed by Colonel Stodare, when, in addition to his admirable feats of ventriloquism and ledger domain, he presents to his patrons a novel illusion called the Sphinx. Placing upon an uncovered table a chest similar in size to the cases commonly occupied by stuffed dogs or foxes, he removes the side facing the spectators and reveals a head attired after the fashion of an Egyptian sphinx. To avoid the suspicion of ventriloquism, he retires to a distance from the figure supposed to be too great for the practice of that art, taking his position on the borderline of the stalls and the area, while the chest is on the stage. Thus stationed, he calls upon the sphinx to open its eyes, which it does, to smile, which it does also, though the habitual expression of its countenance is most melancholy, and to make a speech, which it does also, this being the miraculous part of the exhibition. Not only with perspicuity, but with something like eloquence, does it utter some twenty lines of verse, and while its countenance is animated and expressive, the movement of the lips, in which there is nothing mechanical, exactly corresponds to the sounds articulated. This is certainly one of the most extraordinary illusions ever presented to the public. That the speech is spoken by a human voice, there is no doubt. 
but how is a head to be contrived which being detached from anything like a body confined in a case which it completely fills and placed on a bare-legged table will accompany a speech that apparently proceeds from its lips with a strictly appropriate movement of the mouth and a play of the countenance that is the reverse of mechanical eels as we all know can wriggle about after they have been chopped into half a dozen pieces but a head that like that of the physician duban in the arabian tales pursues its eloquence after it has been severed from its body scarcely comes within the reach of possibilities unless indeed the old-fashioned assertion that king charles walked and talked half an hour after his head was cut off is to be received not as an illustration of defective punctuation but as a positive historical statement davis might have solved the anthropoglossus but colonel stodare presents us with a sphinx that is really worthy of an oedipus for the benefit of those who have never seen this illusion presented upon the stage we will describe its effect a little more minutely the sphinx is always made a separate portion of the entertainment as it is necessary to lower the curtain for a few moments before and after its appearance in order to arrange and remove the necessary preparations the curtain rises and reveals a round or oval table supported upon three slender legs and utterly devoid of drapery this stands in a curtain recess of ten or twelve feet square open on the side towards the audience the performer comes forward bearing a cloth covered box fifteen to twenty inches square and places it upon the table already mentioned he then unlocks the box, the front of which drops down, so as to give a perfect view of the interior in which is seen a head of Egyptian fashion and colored in perfect imitation of life. See frontispiece. The performer now retires to a position in the very midst of the audience, and raising his wand says in a tone of command, Sphinx, awake! The Sphinx slowly opens its eyes, looking first to the front with a strong gaze then as if gradually gaining consciousness to the one side and the other the head moving slightly with the eyes questions are put by the performer to the head and are answered by it the play of the mouth and features being in perfect harmony with the sounds uttered finally in answer to a query of the operator the sphinx declaims a neatly turned oracle in verse this concludes the exhibition and the performer closes the box should the audience call for an encore, the performer addresses them to the following or some similar effect. Ladies and gentlemen, I am glad that the Sphinx has afforded you satisfaction, and I should be only too pleased to be able to indulge the desire which you kindly testify of seeing it again. Unfortunately, this is not possible. The charm by which I am enabled, as you have seen, to revivify for a space the ashes of an ancient Egyptian who lived and died some centuries ago, lasts but for fifteen minutes. That time has now expired, and the head which has astonished you with its mysterious eloquence has again returned to its original dust. As he speaks the last words, he again opens the box, and the head is found to have disappeared, leaving in its place a handful of ashes. This singular illusion depends upon the well-known principle, common to optics as to mechanics, that the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. Thus, if a person standing at the point A in figure 296 look into a mirror placed in the position indicated by the line BC, he will see reflected not himself, but whatever object may be placed at the point D. By an ingenious application of this principle, a looking glass may be used to conceal a given object behind it, while at the same time an image reflected in the glass may be made to represent what would be presumably seen if no glass were there, and thus prevent the presence of the mirror from being suspected. This is the secret of the Sphinx. The table, as already mentioned, has three legs, one in front and one at each side. Between these legs, the spectator sees apparently the curtains at the back of the recess, but really a reflection of the curtains at the sides. The space between the middle leg and that on either side is occupied by pieces of looking glass, see figure 297, which represents a ground plan of the arrangement, extending from A to B and A to C. The glass extends quite down to the floor, which is covered with cloth of the same material and color as the surrounding curtains. The spectators, therefore, looking towards the table, see above it the curtains at the back and below it the reflection of the curtains at the sides, which, however, if the relative angles are properly arranged, appears to be simply the continuation or lower portion of the curtains at the back. 
the illusion is perfect and the spectator from the position assigned to him cannot possibly discover by the evidence of his senses that he is looking at any other than an ordinary bare-legged table with the background visible in the usual way the rest is a very simple matter the person who is to represent the sphinx is beforehand placed duly attired underneath the table there is a trap in the table through which he can pass his head at the proper moment this trap is a round piece of wood covered to match the surface of the table and working on a hinge on the side nearest to the audience it has no spring but is kept closed by means of a button on the opposite side and when released hangs down perpendicularly it must be large enough to allow the passage of the somewhat elaborate headpiece of the sphinx and would therefore leave an open space visible round the neck this difficulty is met by the expedient of having a wooden collar whose upper surface is a facsimile in size and pattern of the trap fastened round the neck of the representative of the sphinx when he lifts his head up through the trap this collar exactly fills the opening and thus shows no break in the surface of the table the box is bottomless and when brought forward by the performer is empty a little caution has to be observed in placing it upon the table for if the performer were to approach the table from the side his legs would be reflected in the glass and would thereby betray the secret he must therefore make his appearance from some quarter outside of the curtain recess and advance to a position well in front of and at some little distance from the table when by moving in a straight line from the audience towards the middle leg a he prevents this inconvenient reflection the placing the box upon the table and the unlocking it allow time for the representative of the sphinx to get his head into position within it this done the box is opened and the rest depends on the dramatic talent of the performer and his assistant the performance being concluded the box is again locked and the head withdrawn a handful of ashes being introduced on the trap in its stead the angle at which the two mirrors should be set cannot be determined absolutely, but will vary according to the distance and position of the surrounding drapery. Some performers use a shawl or a screen of cardboard in place of the box, but we doubt whether any method is more effective than that above described. The ghastly illusion of the so-called decapitated head, which drew crowds to the polytechnic some few years since, was merely the sphinx in a less pleasant form the cabinet of proteus this is another adaptation of the principle on which the sphinx illusion is founded it is the joint inventions of messrs pepper and tobin by whom it was patented in eighteen sixty five the first steps towards a patent for the sphinx were also taken in the same year but the latter invention never proceeded beyond provisional protection the cabinet of proteus is a wooden closet seven to eight feet in height by four or five feet square supported on short legs so as to exclude the idea of any communication with the floor see figure 298 it has folding doors and an upright pillar extends from top to bottom of the interior at about the center of the cabinet at the top of this pillar in front is fixed a lamp so that the whole of the interior is brightly illuminated the cabinet may be used in various ways one of the most striking is as follows the folding doors are open disclosing the interior perfectly empty see figure 299 the exhibitor directs his assistant to walk into the cabinet he does so and the doors are closed meanwhile a couple of gentlemen selected by the audience are invited to stand behind or beside the cabinet and see that no one obtains ingress or egress by any secret opening Notwithstanding these precautions, when the doors are again open, the assistant is found to have vanished, and another person, different in dress, in stature, and in complexion, is found in his place. This person steps forth, makes his bow, and retires. Again the cabinet, now empty, is closed, and after an interval of a few moments, again opened. This time a human skeleton is found to occupy the vacant space this ghastly object having been removed and the door having been once more closed and opened another person say a lady appears this person having retired the doors are again closed and when they are again opened the person who first entered is once more found within a committee from the audience are now invited to examine the cabinet within and without but all their scrutiny cannot detect any hidden space even sufficient to conceal a mouse
An examination of figure 300, representing the ground plan of the cabinet, will make plain the seeming mystery. A movable flap AB, working on hinges at B, extends from top to bottom of each side, resting when thrown open against the post C in the middle, and thus enclosing a triangular space in the back of the cabinet. The outer surfaces of these flaps, i.e. the surfaces exposed when they are folded back against the sides of the cabinet, are, like the rest of the interior, covered with wallpaper of a crimson or other dark color. The opposite sides of the flaps are of looking glass, and when the flaps are folded back against the posts, reflect the surfaces against which they previously rested, and which are covered with paper of the same pattern as the rest. The effect to the eye of the spectator is that of a perfectly empty chamber, though, as we have seen, there is in reality an enclosed triangular space behind the post. This is capable of containing two or three persons, and here it is that the persons and things intended to appear in succession are concealed. The assistant, entering in sight of the audience, changes places as soon as the door is closed with one of the other persons. This person having retired, and the door being again closed, those who are still within place the skeleton in position in front of the post, and again retire to their hiding place. When all the rest have appeared, the person who first entered presses the flaps against the sides of the cabinet, against which they are retained by a spring lock on each side, and the public may then safely be admitted, as their closest inspection cannot possibly discover the secret. The Indian Basket Trick This is another of the sensational feats identified with the name of Colonel Stodare, and is imitated from a similar illusion performed by the Indian conjurers. It is not a pleasant trick to witness, but, like the decapitated head, it drew immense crowds, its fictitious horror being apparently its chief attraction. Its effect, as the trick was originally presented by Stodare, is as follows. A large oblong basket, say five feet by two, and as deep as wide, is brought in, and placed on a low stand or bench so as to be raised clear of the stage. The performer comes forward with a drawn sword in his right hand, and leading with the other hand a young lady, dressed in a closely fitting robe of black velvet. Reproaching her upon some pretended ground of complaint, he declares that she must be punished, and forthwith begins to blindfold her eyes. She simulates terror, begging for mercy, and finally escaping from him, runs off the stage. He follows her, and instantly reappears, dragging her by the wrist. Regardless of her sobs and cries, he compels her to enter the basket in which she lies down, and the lid is closed. Simulating an access of fury, he thrusts the sword through the basket from the front in various places. Piercing screams are heard from the interior, and the sword when withdrawn is seen to be red with blood. The screams gradually subside, and all is still. A thrill of horror runs through the audience, who are half inclined to call in the police and hand over the professor to the nearest magistrate. For a moment there is a pause, and then the performer, calmly wiping the bloody sword on a white pocket handkerchief, says, Ladies and gentlemen, I fear you imagine that I have hurt the lady who is the subject of this experiment. Pray disabuse yourselves of such an idea. She had disobeyed me, and I therefore determined to punish her by giving her a little fright, but nothing more. The fact is, she had left the basket some time before I thrust the sword into it. You don't believe me, I see. Allow me to show you, in the first place, that the basket is empty. He turns over the basket accordingly and shows that the lady has vanished. Should you desire further proof, the lady will answer for herself. The lady at this moment comes forward from a different portion of the room and, having made her bow, retires. This startling illusion is performed as follows. To begin with, there are two ladies employed, in figure and general appearance as nearly alike as possible. Their dress is also exactly similar. The little dramatic scene with which the trick commences is designed to impress upon the audience the features of the lady who first appears. When she is blindfolded, she, as already mentioned, runs off the stage. The performer runs after her, and apparently bringing her back, really brings back in her place the second lady, who is standing in readiness, blindfolded in precisely the same way, behind the scenes. As the bandage covers the greater part of her features, there is little fear of the spectators detecting the substitution that has taken place. The substitute lady now enters the basket, where she lies, compressing herself into as small a compass as possible along the back. 
Knowing the position which she occupies, it is not a very difficult matter for the operator so to direct the thrusts of the sword as to avoid any risk of injuring her. The chief thing to be attended to for this purpose is to thrust always in an upward direction. The appearance of blood on the sword may be produced either by the lady in the basket drawing along the blade, as it is withdrawn after each thrust, a sponge saturated with some crimson fluid, or by a mechanical arrangement in the hilt, causing the supposed blood on pressure to trickle down the blade. The only point that remains to be explained is the difficulty which will probably already have suggested itself to the reader, viz. how does the performer manage to show the basket empty at the close of the trick? Simply by having the basket made on the principle of the inexhaustible box, described at page 391. The performer takes care to tilt the basket over to the front before he raises the lid. This leaves the lady lying on the true bottom of the basket, see figure 302, while a movable flap, fixed at right angles to the bottom and lying in its normal position against the front of the basket, for the time being represents the bottom to the eyes of the audience. While the basket is thus shown apparently empty, the lady who first appeared in the trick comes forward and is immediately recognized by the audience and as they are fully persuaded that she was the person placed in the basket, the inference that she has escaped from it by some quasi-supernatural means seems inevitable. The above is the form in which the trick was first introduced to the London public, but another modus operandi has since been adopted by some performers. The low table or bench on which the basket is placed is in this case constructed on the principle of the sphinx table with looking glass between the legs and with a large trap in the top. The basket used is not made like the inexhaustible box, but the bottom is movable and hinged against the front so as to lift up flat against it when required. One lady only is employed. When she is about to step into the basket, the bottom is pushed up from below, and she thus steps through the basket and the table, and thence passes through a trap door beneath the stage. The basket is then closed and the bottom allowed to fall back into its place. As the basket is left in this case empty, the performer may thrust into it in any direction at pleasure, the screams being uttered by the lady from her safe quarters below. At the proper moment, the performer lifts the basket bodily off the table and shows it really empty, while the lady, as in the former case, reappears in some other quarter. End of section 49. Recording by Caroline Shapiro.